Hello again, biologists. Mr. Kinnear here with another video lesson for National 5 Biology. We're on Unit 3, Life on Earth, and today we're going to look at food production, which is key area 3.5. And the need for food production is obviously driven by world population. Now, if you remember back to the start of this unit when we were talking about the vocabulary of biodiversity, population relates to the number of one species. And this is where we see it most commonly used in society because we're talking about the human species. So as you can see from this graph provided by our world in data, the population of humans has gone from around about 1 billion in 1820 to over 7 billion in just 200 years. So at the time of recording, the population is 7.8 billion. And that's gone up by about 150,000 just in the last day. And it's still rising on a second by second uh, basis. So by the time you're watching this, who knows what the number might be. And if that's the case, that leads to competition for food, shelter and water, because humans are obviously just like any other organism. Uh, there is a competition for resources. So that obviously leads to some issues. And one of the big issues is how do we feed these people? We can grow more crops and to grow more crops, we might need more fields. And that means then cutting down forests to have more fields or graze more cattle. That then obviously leads to deforestation. So loss of habitat for a number of organisms and obviously then losing trees could lead to climate change, the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. So that then has a problem. Or we could try and grow more crops within the fields that we have. That then means that farmers need to use fertilizers. Those fertilizers, chemicals that include things like nitrates, nitrates are really important. You'll come across this in the nitrogen cycle part of your S3 biology. So nitrates dissolve in the soil, they're absorbed by plants and they make proteins which helps them grow faster. Subsequently then, those extra proteins are eaten by other organisms and helps them grow faster too. And we are one of those organisms, or obviously then, Cattle could be another one of those organisms. So fertilizers have a really important part to play in growing extra crops, increasing crop yield, so we could feed that growing population. So fertilizers are incredibly useful for increasing crop yield and therefore feeding the ever growing population, but they can have a negative impact on the environment. And as you can see from this picture, it doesn't look particularly good. This is an example of eutrophication, one of those particular problems. So fertilizers can leach into fresh water, adding extra and unwanted nitrates. Now that can happen by accident or by carelessness, but it can most commonly happen due to heavy rain landing on fields and washing the fertilizer off the field into streams and burns and then accumulating within other waterways. That then causes an increase in algal populations and what you see here is an algal bloom because of that increase. So they're getting all the nitrates that helps them grow. And you see this green film on the top of the waterway there causing a problem. And eutrophication is the aquatic ecosystem response. So extra nitrates through fertilizers or sewage causing these blooms to occur. And it causes quite a negative impact, as we'll see. The process of eutrophication starts with excess fertilizers being flushed into waterways. The nitrates in those fertilizers then help the algae grow and they overgrow. That then causes an algal bloom. And as you saw in that previous picture, that then covers the surface. That then stops light penetrating the water and getting to the plants that are in the water. They can't then photosynthesize and produce oxygen. So that leads to their death and a drop in oxygen within the water. And when those plants die, they're decomposed by bacteria. And the bacteria that are decomposing the plant material also use up oxygen. So therefore, we're reducing the oxygen levels even further. We then get to that stage where the oxygen in the water is fully depleted. Now, if there's no oxygen, then the fish in there and other organisms will not cope and they will die as well. So the whole system then falls apart and collapses because of this fertilizer. And this diagram from Scholar shows uh, those steps happening uh, within the aquatic environment. 
it is showing that steps one, two, three, four, five are happening in order of time. So as you can see, we've got that uh, extra nutrient load coming in from maybe sewage or fertilizers. Those plants flourish. Um, you can get some extra growth of duckweed as well as other plants, but the algae are the key thing. They can grow incredibly quickly. Uh, that bloom then blocks off the light that is getting to the rest of the plants. Therefore, they die and the oxygen is depleted. The dead plant's broken down. Uh, bacteria decomposers do that and they use up even more oxygen. That then leads to a full death of the ecosystem. So it's a point where no life is possible. So fish and other organisms die. Now, this is particularly an issue when you've got ponds and lakes. Because obviously, if you have issues like this that are happening in rivers with fast moving water, then that will move the algae away and therefore it might return to a bit of normality. But if you've got still water, so you see ponds and lakes, that's where the real issues can happen. So how can we reduce that impact? Well, one way is through genetic engineering. So scientists have developed genetically modified crops that can grow with less fertilizer. So that means your farmers can use less fertilizers while still getting good crop yield and feeding the population. However, people do still have concerns with genetic engineering, especially when it comes to putting genetically modified organisms into the food chain. And that relates back to key area 1.5, where we discussed at length genetic engineering and also talked about the ethical considerations when it comes to that process. Another issue we have with our food production are pests. Pests are insects mainly that eat our crops and therefore lower the crop yield. So we employ pesticides, chemicals which are used to destroy those pests. Now DDT was a widely used pesticide that was found to have massive toxic effects on the environment. And it was widely used in the 50s and 60s, it was massive. I've seen images of it being used in paint for screen doors, uh, as you can see from that image in the bottom right hand corner, being sprayed as go down streets, uh, sprayed from aeroplanes, sprayed into classrooms, sprayed on people's clothes. Uh, it was widely used because people thought it was so effective at just killing bugs, A, on our crops, but B, just in our lives that you know, were just annoying. One of the problems is that DDT is not easily broken down by the environment and therefore it maintained within the environment and within our food chains. So here's an example of a food chain that could end up being toxic due to the use of a pesticide like DDT. As you can see, we've got the sparrow hawk being one of the top predators within this food chain. It gets its energy from leaves and berries through earthworm and robin, equally uh, leaves and berries to mouse to sparrow hawk. And you've also got other options of leaves and berries or dandelions into rabbit and then to sparrow hawk as well. So if we put that food chain into a pyramid of numbers, you can remember from previous lessons that the leaves and berries will have high numbers and a small size. And as we go up this food chain, the sparrow hawk at the top will have low numbers and a big size, which means that the sparrow hawk will likely eat lots of robins. And those robins will eat lots of earthworms and the earthworms will eat lots of leaves and berries. That is what causes our problem when it comes to a pesticide like DDT. So if we show this example that each leaf receives one dose of DDT when it's sprayed on the crops, as you can see from those red dots. So as we go up, each earthworm eats three leaves and therefore receives three doses of DDT. And then each robin eats two worms, so it receives six doses. When we get to the top, we've got a sparrow hawk eating two robins, therefore receiving 12 doses of DDT. Because, as I said, DDT is not broken down or biodegraded within the food chain, so it persists. And as you go up the food chain, we increase the levels of dose, we increase the levels of toxicity. So this is what's referred to as bioaccumulation. It's the buildup of substances such as pesticides in an organism. And the sparrow hawk is a genuine example. They were found to develop high concentrations of DDT within their systems as it went through the food chain. They then laid eggs with really thin shells. And obviously birds sit on their eggs to incubate them 
that unfortunately then broke the eggs before they were able to hatch, leading to a decline in their population. And as we've discussed before, changing the numbers of an organism within a food web can have a massive impact, particularly at the top of a food chain. And this is just another example of how humans can cause massive problems within the environment. So let's look at a more natural way of managing pests. Biological controls, they're environmentally sound and chemical free methods of managing pests by using their natural enemies. An example being ladybirds. You might think of them as cute little bugs, but they're pretty mean predators. They eat aphids, a green fly, uh, which are capable of destroying crops like roses or soft fruit. A bit more gruesome would be a parasitic wasp. So they combat things like caterpillars and whitefly, injecting their eggs into the insect. And eventually their larvae eat their way out once they're hatched. Or things like birds of prey, so barn owls or hawks can be used to catch rodents, which eat our crops as well. So that's a way of doing things by utilising normal food chains, um, chemical free way of managing pests. And that leads us to the end of the lesson. So today we've looked at an ever increasing world population putting pressure on food production. So we therefore use things like fertilisers and pesticides to maintain our crop yields. The fertilisers, however, can cause problems such as eutrophication if they end up in waterways. And also pesticides can cause problems such as bioaccumulation if they persist in the environment and not broken down readily. So hopefully you found that useful and informative. As always, if you have any problems, questions or queries, get in touch and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.